We're so glad to see everybody, and I just want to let you know we're doing this new series today, and we're beginning. Today's more of an introduction than anything else. We're going to be sharing what is going on. What does the Bible say about the end of the age? I know we've been talking about heaven and hell, and as a result of talking about heaven and hell, we kind of dealt with the end of all of us. All of us, one day, unless we get raptured out, are going to face death, and what happens when you die? That was a a couple of weeks ago, you can go on cornerstonecheshire.com or go to Spotify or uh, YouTube or Apple Podcast, and you can sign up for that and get caught up to date with what's going on. Okay, today we're talking about the end, basically, the end times. What's going to happen during the end times? And so I want to preface a couple of things for you. How many of you are familiar with that, uh, if you don't know it, that, that nursery story about the, the little boy that cried wolf? Are you familiar with the story? In case you don't know what happened, this boy kept saying he had to watch the, the, the sheep. He said, if, if the wolf comes, let us know. He kept crying wolf, and there's no wolf. And after a while, no one believed him anymore. And I would say, unfortunately, in the church in the last, I'd say, 35 years or 40 years, the church has been crying wolf about the rapture and the second coming, and he's coming now. We had 88 reasons in 88. If you don't remember that, count yourself blessed. We had all sorts of people predicting things and saying that Christ is going to come back and this is going to take place and this is the end and left behind. And I'm not saying those things are bad, but a lot of people had these ideas. And great, if you were born in the 70s or lived in the 70s, the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey came out, uh, the, 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 the thief in the night and all these things. And we've been thinking, we've been hearing about Christ. And after a while, I was like, all right, already. You guys have been talking about this. And it's all predictions that don't come true. I'm frankly tired of it. I'm confused by it. And I've had enough. And you're like, the little boy that cried wolf, you, your church keeps on crying wolf. This is the end. This is the antichrist. This is the other. Now we have, you know, Magog and Gog and all that kind of thing. What's going on? Ezekiel 38 and, and, and all these things. They're not bad in themselves, but it can get to the point where we're like overloaded by it and so many devi divisive opinions. In fact, I don't know if you realize this, but there was a time the church prior to uh, the 1900s, the, the late 1800s, uh, prior to World War I, there was a theory of eschatology that was becoming a, a lot more popular. It was post-millennialism. Millennialism millennial is, a, is the rule and reign of Christ on the earth. And so there was, uh, prior to World War I and World War II, there was a belief system that the church was going to make the world better and better and better. It's going to get so good that Jesus comes back. We're going to make everything great, and Christ is going to come back. Now, all that had to happen was World War I, 1929, <laughs> and World War II. And that theory is put, no, I don't hear anyone talk about that one anymore, right? Now, predominantly, you hear a lot about free trip and all that. What's the deal with all that? What's going on with all that? Let me just tell you something. Jesus is abundantly clear. He says the following. He says, no one knows the hour or the day, nor the angels. And he goes, neither the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus. He says, I, I, the angels don't know. Okay, the devil does not know. Only God, only God the Father knows. And so no one knows the day and the hour. Now, since Jesus said that, why do people constantly say, I know the day and the hour? In fact, at the end of um, Acts chapter 1, before Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples came to him privately and said, Jesus, Jesus, oh, you're going to restore the kingdom now. What's going to happen? Is this the end? And this is what Jesus says. Are you ready? It's not for you to know the times and the epochs. Epochs are seasons that the Father has sent. But this is what you are to do. Wait, you are to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Samaria, and across the world. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is basically telling us, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that God has set in place. So what are we to do at the end times? Let, let, let me kind of, again, reiterate what I've been saying a long time. If you're looking for someone to tell you exactly what's going to happen, I'm going to have charts behind me. And basically, God himself is going to have to come down here and learn how he's going to come back. <laughs> this is not the church for you. We don't do that here. Okay? What we're going to do is this. How many of you like puzzles? Okay? I like puzzles. 
How many of you have tried to do a puzzle without having a box top? You know, the box top, yeah, it shows you the picture, and you have to look at it, and it's really relaxing to do puzzles. It kind of helps get your mind off of everything. At least it does for me. So, but uh, the end times is like putting a puzzle together without the box top. All we have, we have scriptures, we have scenes in scripture, but we don't know, we don't know exactly how it works, right? Don't worry, it's not the second coming yet. <laughs> and so what happens is we don't know. So what do you do, what do, you do in a puzzle? You put the pieces that are obvious together, right? You, you get the straight edges. Okay, I got the edges here. You do, you do that, okay? There's a lightning, okay? So you, do, you get the straight edges together, and you get the parts that are obvious. That's what you do, right? Okay. The Bible has told us the obvious pieces that are indisputable. They are known, they're clear, and they're really what you really need to know. The other things are important, but not essential. So we should not divide over non-essentials such as pre-trib, mid-trib, no-trib, amillennialism, pre-millennialism, post-millennialism, or post-serial. It doesn't make a difference. We should not divide over that. There are certain things that are abundantly clear that are extremely important to know, and those are the things that are indisputable that the Bible is abundantly clear on. Now, in the military, they have something called need-to-know basis, right? You're given the information you need to know. The Bible has given us the primary, extremely clear and prolific things about the end of the age that, are, that we know and that's clear. The other parts, we're not quite sure about. Why? As Christ came the first time, in many ways, he'll come the second time. For example, the first time Jesus came, they had it all figured out just like we do today. They had the Sadducees. They're Sadducee because they don't believe in the resurrection. They're like the liberal church. Sorry to do that, but they're the ones that don't believe the script. They don't believe the resurrection of the dead. They believe a lot of the, the, the things in the Bible are allegory. And, and so they kind of pick and choose what they like, like a lot of people do today. Then you had the conservative church. I don't know what's going on up here. Then you had the conservative church. The conservative church were the Pharisees, and these guys had all the rules down, and they memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Imagine that. And they believed in the resurrection of the dead, and they believed that God was going to come back as a conquering king. The Messiah was going to come and rescue them, and everything's going to be great. And then Jesus came. And he basically knocked the theory off. In fact, Jesus had some of these radical people within his own discipleship. They had people within them themselves. And they had radicals that wanted to take over. Okay? And what did Jesus do? Instead of coming as a conquering king, he came as a suffering servant. Why? Because they read the Bible as a as a, uh, a chronological event that was in Scripture, and they figured out the chronology, but the chronology was wrong. Christ came to do it in the, in the Spirit first, and then later on to do it physically. In fact, next week, I'm going to help explain to you why it's taking so long for Christ to come back, and I believe I'm going to bring some clarity why is it taking so long, why didn't he come back now? So that's next week. I'm serious. I'm not just saying that. And Pastor Rainey's not going to do it. I'm going to do it, okay? I know I will Okay, uh, if someone could give me another microphone, that'd be awesome, because uh, we're having a little bit of technical issues here today. Thank you. We've had a bunch of lightning storms, and I don't know if we've noticed. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Okay, giving it up for Sam. All right. Yeah, we've had some electrical storms and all that kind of thing, but we're, we're continuing on, okay? Uh, wherever I was, I'm going to get back. Oh, yes. They, they, they believe that Christ is going to come back a certain way, and what happened was he did not come back in the way they thought. Now, are you aware of the fact not even the devil knew how Christ was going to come exactly? There was enough mystery around it. So it even says if they knew what they were going to do, they would never have killed Jesus because that was, the, that was the winning thing. They thought they beat, and that was the thing that beat them. Why? The element of surprise. 
There are some things about the second coming that are going to surprise everybody. And I am thoroughly convinced that no one has it completely right. And we should not divide over these things. We should focus on the absolutes. Do you recognize the fact that even after Jesus rose again from the dead, the disciples tapped him on the show, hey, Jesus, how are we going to do this again? He says, not for you to know the times of the epochs the Father sent in order, as I mentioned earlier. But this is all what you are to do. Need to know basis. You have what you need to know. You don't know what's going on in the war room where they're making all the plans of how they're going to do the battle, but you need to know what you have to know. And it's top secret. And so Christ is going to come back. We have the information that we need to know. And when it happens, oh, that's how it works. It's almost like an Agatha Christie murder mystery. <laughs> oh, that's who, the butler didn't do it. I know, if you don't know who that is, never mind. Okay. Everyone over 60 knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Everyone under 16 is like, what? Okay. And you know, let me just show you, as I mentioned in previous weeks, this is the absolutes. This is very clear in Scripture. Okay. Jesus died on the cross, right? To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, or in a place called Hades, right? Then Christ is going to come back. When is he going to come back? There are certain signs that have to happen that are going to take place. He comes back, and we're going to be raptured. The question is, when does the rapture take place? The Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Even though they're in paradise, the, 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 the souls, I mean the spirits of the people are in paradise, and they have some sort of spiritual body, they're going to be resurrected with a new glorified body when Christ comes back. So they'll rise up and have new bodies, and then we, all right, who are also here will be raising up as well, the question is, does he come first through pre-trip, I mean, through a pre-trip rapture, or does he come at the end? The Bible does not tell us exactly, and I can make an argument for each one, okay? But one thing we know, he's going to come back, right? And then everyone's going to have to give an account for how they live their lives, right? Great right throne of judgment. Is your name written in the last book of life? You say you're a Christian, show me the evidence, right? Not by necessarily, not only what you believe, but... Does your faith align what you believe? And then there's a new heavens and new earth, and there's final, final hell, lake of fire, and those that are with God forever, and a new earth, new heavens and new earth. That's very clear. Now, this part is not so clear. It's there, but we don't know the order of the whole thing. You got the pre, mid, post, millennial reign. And then I tell you what I t tend to believe, but the millennial reign's going to happen first. What's going to take place? And so these are up for debate, but they're not essential for your salvation and for what you need to know. They're interesting. They're important to know. That's why we're going to talk about it in the next several weeks. Several, not seven. Okay? So we want to know this, but the yellow is absolutely essential, and the Bible is abundantly clear. Those things are going to happen. Are you tracking with me? All right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to just kind of do a little introduction because we have communion today as well. We want to spend enough time in communion. What I'm going to basically do is we're going to actually read Scripture. And Jesus had a lot to say about the second coming. In fact, 20% of your Bible deals with the end of the age. Okay? So we're going to deal with those things. So we're going to look at what Jesus talked about. Are you guys ready to study the Word of God? Okay? So it's a little different today. Uh, but we're going to just kind of more of an introduction. I just want to make sure everyone understands. Can we give grace to each other if someone has a different view than you do, right? I think we can all agree on these. If you're a believer, you believe in all those. This part, let's, let's be gracious to each other. It's fun to talk about. And, and, and there's, there's well many people that believe in pre. There's well many people that believe in mid. There's well many people and, and lovers of Christ that believe in post. There are people that believe in amillennialism and other amillennialism, Okay. And we love each other. But the most important thing is Jesus is the Son of God. There's only one way to God. It's through Jesus Christ, right? And one day we'll have new heavens and new earth. That's what's important. All right. Now, Jesus was talking to his disciples. What we're going to do today, we're looking at the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, there's a discourse that Jesus has on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, by the way, is in Jerusalem. Mount of Olives is opposite the side where, where the Jerusalem gates are. I've been there. We had a group of over 45 people from our church has been there a couple years ago, back in 2019. It's a place where Jesus ascended into heaven. So what happened was they were watching Jesus. He was talking to them, and all of a sudden he kind of dissipated, and he went to another place. And the disciples are like this.
Okay, look, looking up. I did that to get for a little dramatic effect. Okay. <laughs> and the angel says, what are you doing? What are you looking at? Jesus told you to go. Don't look up. So sometimes we're like this. How did they come back? And we, we get into these things that don't matter. It's like when your mother tells you, when you're a child, I want you to clean your room, but you organize your baseball cards. That's not what she asked you to do, right? She didn't ask you to put all your things together. She asked you to, to clean the room. God's asking us to do these things. And we get, so what happens is, I want you to go back and wait. So, so we came to the temple. Uh, as he came out of the temple, this is back before Jesus rose again from the dead, okay? Uh, he said, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what a wonderful buildings. So they were pretty impressed. And by the way, Herod built a wonderful temple in, in Jerusalem for the Jewish people. It was gorgeous. The buildings were amazing. They're looking at, look at this beautiful architecture. Isn't it wonderful, Jesus? Isn't it wonderful, the church that we have? Isn't it wonderful? And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? Uh-huh. There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. They're like, what? Say what? And for those of you that grew up in the wonderful era of the 80s, what's that, Willis? Say what, Willis? Okay. Thank you. I, okay. Okay. Everyone else, what are you talking about? Don't worry about it. You missed out on a great era. <laughs> okay. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one left here. Now, what is so interesting is in 70 A.D., after Jesus rose again from the dead and went to heaven, the Romans had enough of the insurrectionists in Jerusalem. So guess what they did? They completely destroyed the temple and every vested, every religious thing of Judaism in Jerusalem was destroyed. So Jesus' prophecy happened. But Jesus talks about that, and then he talks about the end of the age where it's going to happen to another degree. And so the disciples did not understand what he was talking about, so they're asking Jesus, what's going on here? So later on, they sit with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, which is a very significant place. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite of the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all of these things are about to be accomplished? Hey, Jesus, give us a, the inside scoop. We got to bet on this and make some money. No, that's not what he's talking about. How are we going to know what's going to happen? And so Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Now, why would Jesus say, see that no one leads you astray? Because it's easy to be led astray. You guys are brilliant this morning. Okay. He began to say, see that no one leads you astray. Why is that? See, why? Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Okay? These things are like birthing pangs. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against na a kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pangs. Then... They will deliver you up to tribulation. Tribulation means difficulty. I don't know what it is about us as Americans. Do you realize the amount of tribulation the early church had? They were martyred. They were dipped in wax and lit on fire. They were both tortured for Christ, right? And we as Americans, if we get upset if we, take, if we don't have an internet, right? Jesus, take me home. I don't have internet. So they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be what? Hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Doesn't that sound wonderful? And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. We've been seeing a proliferation of false prophets and false teachers happen. Let me give you a case in point. The Apostle Paul said in the Scripture very, very clearly, he said, if anyone were to come to you with a different gospel, let him be accursed. He says, what did the Apostle Paul said in Scripture? If I come with you 
with a different gospel. Or an angel of heaven were to come with you a different gospel, let him be accursed. So what is he saying? The gospel I've told you and you've heard from Jesus is true. If I contradict myself, I'm accursed. If an angel comes from heaven, let him be accursed. Do you recognize that Islam, now I know in other parts of the world, I get in trouble for saying this, but Islam, there was a man by the name of Muhammad, a little bit after the first century, who, what happened? An angel came to him and gave him a different gospel. So-called angel came to him, right? And this is how Islam was born. What does the scripture say? If an angel or someone gets a different gospel, let him be accursed. So Islam is a false religion. I would venture to say people that follow Islam and Muslims are wonderful people. But the ideology of it is, is demonic in nature. It is. I was in Malaysia not too long ago. If I were to get on a street corner and say that, I'd be in prison right now, and you'd be talking to the State Department trying to get me out of prison. They don't allow any discourse of any kind of uh, disagreement over there. Okay? That's dangerous. Anytime a society polices speech where you cannot express yourself, there is a demonic delusion upon a culture. That's why we should support free speech even if you disagree with it. Okay? If there's a Muslim that's being shut down, I'm going to stand up for the Muslim to be able to speak their, speak their what they believe. Why? Because they can come against us. You follow me? All right? Jesus gave us free will. So what's basically happened, you have Islam. Then you have other religions in the world. In the recent days, we've had Mormonism, where Joseph Smith, up, upstate New York, he had, a, he had these golden tablets. An angel came to him. I think it was a demon. He was also on psychedelics, by the way. And he came up with this crazy doctrine of Mormonism, which is absolutely, I'm sorry to tell you, it's way, it's crazy. I'm telling you. They use the same language we use, but it means something different. Jesus, mean, Jesus and the devil are brothers. And one, yeah, God one time was like us, and now rules his own, one, one, one of these days you are not going to have our own world. Women are treated very poorly. The minorities are treated very poorly. It's bad news. It's demonic. I'm telling you. No, are Mormons nice people? Yes. Are they deceived? Yes. You have Jehovah's Witness, same type of thing. All right? So you're going to see this is a proliferation. We see New Ageism. We see syncretism where you take parts of Christianity and mix it with other things. So uh, what will happen? Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of what? Lawlessness. What does lawlessness mean? People do what's right in their own eyes. I don't care what the law says. I'm going to do it my way. Okay? Because of lawlessness will be increased the love of many will go cold. Have you noticed how the love of many has grown cold? My friends, that's a scary thing. When I hate that person, I hate you. Wow, if that happens in your life, there's something wrong. Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion upon the crowds. Jesus was on the cross to the very people that were crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first martyr of the church, Stephen, said, Father, do not hold us against them as he's being stoned with stones. Okay? When we begin to hate people, that's not right. It's, and what happens? Lawlessness. I do whatever I want to do. What happens when the lawlessness happens? The love grows cold. If your love is growing cold in your marriage, if your love is growing cold towards other people, there's a problem. That problem means there's lawlessness. What does lawlessness mean? It means I'm my own God, and I do what I want, and no one tells me what to do. That's lawlessness. And each of us have this lawlessness seeds in our life. And we got to pull those weeds and put weed kill on that thing and say, I, there's only one person who carries the law. It's the Almighty God, and I will submit to him. Him. The basic reason we live is to know God and submit to him, to be loved by him, to love him back. You and I are not capable of managing ourselves without God. Okay, so that's lawlessness. By the way, you're better off with a dictator than have lawlessness. You can talk to Dr. Franco, who was with us several weeks ago, what's going on in Haiti right now. There's this complete anarchy. You're better off with a North Korean dictator or Vladimir Putin than having lawlessness. Do you follow me? So when you see people not paying attention, to, that's not a good thing. Okay? The love of many will go cold, but the one who what? Endures to the end will be saved. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Is that works-based? I don't know. It just says the one who endures to the end will be saved. What does that mean? It means the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
How could you say, I believe one saved, always saved? Let me say something. What does the Bible say? Okay? Look, hang on before you cancel me and get upset and walk out of here and, and give me an email, which happens, by the way, and a, and a handwritten letter. I'm not God. Okay? I'm not suggesting. But the Bible says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, this is written in Greek, translated in English. All right? Uh, the New Testament writers were not trying to write a code book. They were trying to write clear, clearly, and they use Greek. And when the Bible says those who endure to the end will be saved, that's what he's talking about. Now, can you lose your salvation like you lose your keys? No. Okay? And people would say, well, they were never saved in the first place. The Bible says make sure your election is, is good. Now, if you mess up on your way home from church and someone cuts you off in the parking lot and you use sign language... We have cameras. We'll see it. Doesn't mean you're going to hell. You follow me? If, if you blow it and you drink or you do something immoral, doesn't mean you're going to hell. But when you say, I'm going to do it my own way, I don't care what God says, then i got to ask you the question, are you even saved in the first place? So we're not going to get into, are you, make sure your election is strong. Okay, you're in the center of God's hand. Nothing can, I don't want you being scared, thinking you make one mistake, you're going to hell. No. Believe me, when you say, when you don't care anymore about being saved, that's when it's a real problem. If you care, you're probably okay. Does that make sense? All right. I appreciate the amen there. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Whoa, what does that mean? Okay, this gospel is what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Will be preached to all nations. The Greek word for nations is ethnos. Ethnos is people group, not geographical boundaries, which we have on the map today. Do you realize if I were to draw a circle around Cornerstone Church, a 25-mile radius, there are ethnicities around us that may have not heard the gospel. And so we support ministries that translate the gospel into um, different language groups. There's about, uh, last time I checked, there was, a, there was a, I'm not quite sure where we're at, the American Bible Society. Some people say there's about 300 people that the language has not been. Some people say 170. I don't know. But with AI and all the computer things we have now, we can translate a lot faster than we used to. And it's very, very possible that in our lifetime, even in the next 15 years, that every single language on the planet can have a representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is significant. We even have instantaneous translations almost. I can speak into chat GPT and it could talk to you in Spanish. It's not that great, by the way. I tried it. But it's getting there. You follow me? So this is all part of the issue that's going on. So this gospel will be preached, proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testament to all nations, and then the end will come. So it could very well be that these are, these are hallmarks. These are like milestones that we have to know about. Now, Jesus also says that Jerusalem will be tread under the feet of the Gentiles until the end. Okay, what happened in 1947? We'll talk more about next week. Israel became a nation. Oh, what happened in 1948, that is, 1948. What happened in 1967? They recaptured Jerusalem. So now Jerusalem is under the control of the Jewish people. Can a nation be born in one day, it says in Scripture? Yes, it can, and it was. My friends, that is significant. Jews coming back to Christ is significant. Okay, that's on the time clock as well. So you see all these check, check, all these boxes are being checked, right? Let me say something really profound. And this is maybe a little arrogant, but I'm going to tell you. We're closer today to the coming of Christ than we were yesterday. That you can take to the bank. So I just want to stop there for today because we want to have an opportunity to have communion. But let me just encourage you, okay? Let me just reiterate what I'm telling you. What's essential is abundantly clear like a puzzle. We have the edges. We have the basic parameters. We don't necessarily know all the intricate things in the middle. We're going to talk about those things because they do matter, and I'm going to respect people's different views. In this church, I am not a pastor that tells you what to believe. I tell you what the Bible says, my, and I'll tell you my opinion, and I'll make a difference between what the Bible says and my opinion. If you want a church that tells you everything you're supposed to believe and you have to listen to your pastor for everything, this is not the place for you. 
We don't believe in a dictatorship pastorhood. We believe the pastor is supposed to work to hear from the Lord as a congregation, and we are, are going to be dogmatic on what the Bible's dogmatic on, but with the Bible's silent on such as this, we're going to give grace. Does that make sense, everybody? I know it's better, it's, it's, it feels better to have someone tell you everything. I'm not going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you three or four different views. And I might share with what I believe if you come back next week. And the hot sauce is on its way. So, can we all bow our heads just for a moment? Father, we thank you so much that you are a wonderful God, a gracious God, a compassionate God. And, Lord, we are asking right now that you would touch every single person, that every person would know how much you love them. Father, we thank you that one day you will come back. Lord, I pray that we would be ready for your coming, whether it's today, tomorrow, a year from now. Father, that we would be ready at any moment. For, Father, we recognize that we could die at any moment. So we should always be ready. We realize that today is the day of salvation. So, Lord, I pray that we lay aside our differences, that we would focus on the absolutes and recognize that, Jesus, you don't even know the day or the hour, but you know the season. And I pray, Father, that we be uh, sensitive to the season in Jesus' name.